So I never in a million years would have dreamed that, number one, I would have wound up in a war zone taking care of a Kurdish general and his concubines on a compound where you would be driving out the front gate trying to shoo the ostrich out of the way. One of the greatest things about being a PA and also to some extent being an NP is just the flexibility that you have. The ability to work within different specialties in medicine, but also the ability to work in such different settings. I have already on this channel done an interview with a PA who worked down at the research center at the South Pole. I'll have that linked here if you're interested in seeing that video. Um, but today I'm going to talk to a PA who has worked in remote and austere environments around the world. And she's going to tell us some of those experiences she's had, some kind of wild stories and just the excitement that her career has been. She's also going to share some of the experience that she thinks that you should have in order to get these jobs, what kind of certifications you might need, and where you go to find these jobs. So if all of this sounds fascinating to you, whether you're looking to find one of those jobs yourself, or if just kind of curious to hear what experiences this PA has had, then stay tuned. My name is Melinda Rockliffe. I've been a PA now for about 15 years. I uh, love what I got the opportunity to do and never thought that I would wind up having the crazy career that I have. Well, that's what we're here today to find out about is this crazy career. Why don't you give us first just kind of a, a brief overview, and then we'll dive into some of those jobs that you did a little bit deeper. Well, I started out going to PA school when I was in my mid-30s because I had been a paramedic EMT Prior to PA school. So when I graduated, I ended up getting kind of pulled into a wonderful rural ER and I loved it. So I ended up making a career out of that, which eventually turned into me going overseas. I ended up in two war zones. I've done offshore oil drilling. I've built ice roads in the Arctic. So I've got to take my career in a different direction than what most people do, but I've also gotten to learn and appreciate other people's uh, career paths as well. I'm excited, interested to hear about some of these opportunities that you've had. My first contract, I was in Baghdad. I was told that I would be in a camp uh, with a group of individuals that was doing a support contract. And my job would be to basically work in that clinic. When I got there, I actually found out that it was basically made out of conic boxes that had a small trauma bay uh, and then one patient care room. Uh, I was the only provider above the level of the paramedic there. Quite different than what I expected. How long did you do that particular job? So I went from uh, Iraq over to Afghanistan uh, with just a short couple week break in between. So all told, I was there about two years. Were you taking care of just soldiers or did you also take care of civilians? What, who were you seeing when you were over there? So ironically, once I got there, I realized that that camp had only been there for uh, less than a couple of months and they were actually no longer on a military base. We were on a private military compound that was owned by the Special Forces General from Kurdistan. But uh, we just had a small, about 150 person encampment on the backside of his compound. So we were cut off from the embassy, from the military. We were quite literally isolated on our own. I was very lucky. I had a camp of medics that were, a lot of them were old uh, 18 Delta, had either left the military or retired out of the military. And 18 Deltas are special operations medics. They have a tremendous amount of experience, and I was very lucky to be placed in an encampment with some fabulous individuals. So they taught me what it was like to live on a forward operating base of FOB, and uh, they taught me tactical weapons handling, but they also taught me tactical medicine. And one of the things that they were wonderful about was that they truly did function more like a PA would, and then I functioned more like a chief medical officer or a physician would. So they actually saw the majority of the patients uh, for sick call. It was only if they had questions or were going to give a prescription that we had a quick conversation and maybe I even went in to see the patient. They also taught me about how to go and run missions outside the wires. So we were doing personal uh, or private security details uh, with private individuals that would contract with our company. Yeah, so what kind of things were you seeing on, on a daily basis? So our day-to-day -day stuff was sick call, flu, cough, cold. But of course, our gentlemen and ladies 
ran outside the wire on a daily basis. So unfortunately, we did have a few instances where they were uh, their convoy was hit and they can't just run to a local hospital. So we bring people back in, we stabilize them and beg for services from the U.S. military or one of the, or one of the allied forces. You said something about taking care of, of the general or something. The Kurdish general, his base we were on, he had four wives and then he had a camp full of concubines, literally his term, not mine. Uh, the <laughs> ladies that were on his base as well. And these were beautiful young ladies, well-educated. They were very well taken care of. So it was not unusual for me to get called out and do house calls for them for urinary tract infections, upper respiratory tract infections and simple things. But the general himself was under a great amount of stress. He loved American cigarettes by the caseload, oh. had some upper respiratory issues. And unfortunately, he was a profound diabetic. So uh, it was not unusual for me to have to do house calls with him because he was under high stress and we were trying to keep him obviously happy because he was our host, but also also healthy. So I never in a million years would have dreamed that, number one, I would have wound up in a war zone, excuse me, conflict zone, taking care of a Kurdish general and his concubines <laughs> on a compound where when you went to leave the compound, he had a small zoo there. So you would be driving out the front gate, trying to shoo the ostrich out of the way so you could get to the gate. I don't know how you put stuff like that on your resume. (laughs) Able to wrangle ostriches. It's nuts. All right. So after after the concubine taken care of and the ostrich wrangling and all of that stuff, where did you move to after that job? Uh, after Iraq, I went to Afghanistan, and it was still a lot of the same things. We were seeing a lot of the same things, but uh, this is where I was starting to come into contact with other agencies, FBI, CIA. They all have bases, places, but not just us. I also worked with a gentleman from the Gendarmerie, from, and you know, never thought that I would learn French, and did a little bit. And then, of course, uh, British Special Services. It just became this community and this family that you were working with. So even though the job on a day-to-day basis may have been the same, uh, the people you were interacting with were completely different and amazing. But it was time for me to go home. Those are high-stress jobs that it's difficult to stay in for very long term. And again, these are all just uh, contracts with companies that hire PAs to do stuff like this. And towards the end, um, and then down below in the description box, I'll have links to some of the different companies that people can look into if they're interested in this kind of thing. So any of those times that you were in Iraq or Afghanistan, was the base ever like under fire or were you ever in like any kind of direct danger? Yeah, Uh, unfortunately, we did get hit on a fairly regular basis uh, in Kabul. And I did wear ballistics vests to work uh, the majority of the days. Wow. Um, I I hope was the pay commensurate to the the danger that you're under. I mean, was this, were you getting good pay or not necessarily? At the time, the pay was actually pretty good. It was about um, maybe one and a half times what I could make in the U.S. in an emergency room. Uh, Nowadays, those, those good paying contracts have dried up and gone away. Okay, so let's move from overseas to the U.S., but probably one of the, the farthest outposts in the U.S. that you can get, right? So tell us the name of this island again and, and what is, what's happening on this island. If you're a World War II buff, I uh, may actually know it, but Shimia Island is out at the end of the Aleutian chain of islands um, off the Alaskan coast. And as you run out that chain of islands, quite literally the next island over is Russia. And it has a very large runway and some very large uh, antenna and arrays that were part of the old Star Wars system. There is not a military person one out there. It is 100% contractors. So that runway gets maintained for a multitude of reasons. Partially that island is very military strategic. And part of it is for, you know, commercial reasons. So roughly how many people are stationed on that island? It depends upon the projects that are actively going on. You have between 100 and about 200 people. With that old Star Wars era technology comes some lovely but older gentlemen that had worked with that technology when it was new and they were young. So that made our our patient population, the number of lives that we were responsible for, a great age range. I had anywhere from early 20s, you know, late early 20s up until their 70s. So when you're talking about that range, you just never know what you're going to get walking in the door. There's nothing else on the island, right? There's just this base, right? 
So you are living and working with these same people day in and day out. All your meals are taken in the same cafeteria, I assume. Um, and you are available 24-7 in case anything happens. And were you the only one, the only medical person, or were there other medical personnel there? Like you said, there's no native population. It is 100% contractors. Uh, but they are very good about understanding that there is only self-rescue on that two mile by four mile wide island. The clinic was run by two PAs. So we had no ancillary staff. So we were everything from the receptionist to the care provider to the pharmacist dispensing and mixing our own medications. I had to evac patients more than once where we took them out on a private plane. And so I had to leave the island with that patient and I left my counterpart on island. And so that's why there was two. Actually, I'd seen a posting for this before. It was several years ago. But for that 24-7 and for living on this island and, and having no access to anything else other than that base, I thought they were paying pretty well because, again, you're not paying housing, room and board, all that kind of stuff. Is that still a good deal going on there or is that kind of changed as well? Unfortunately, uh, when I was there and what they're paying now are still almost the same thing. Uh, and it was about ten to 12000 a month. Part of the challenges like with Shumia is that uh, it's not for everybody, so it's difficult for them to get PAs. So there was one point where I was on that island for six straight months because they had nobody to relieve me to come out. Living in such a small, confined area and not having or doing anything different, it's like, how, how was that uh, for six months? Very, very challenging. Um, I've had many friends over the years that have worked places like Antarctica, the same thing. Uh, alcohol becomes like it's a pro sport. Drinking is a pro sport in those kind of places. Uh, these are also very cold places. So when you're stuck someplace where the high uh, on a good day is 55 degrees and maybe the wind isn't blowing 30 miles an hour, you go lay on a giant rock and bask like a lizard because that's the closest thing you're going to get to a beach day. So you have good days and you have bad days. It's it's absolutely not for everyone. You have to be willing to put up with that that isolation. Um, some people thrive in that. Uh, yeah. And you will see people that are out on these contracts for many, 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 many years. How busy were you? Like, were you seeing patients every day or would there be days, several days where you didn't even have anybody? And what was like a, a busy day like? Most days we saw maybe five or six patients. You're in clinic for 12 hours a day, but you're fighting the boredom for the better part of eight or 10 of those hours in the course of the day. A lot of people do online doctorate programs during those or continuing education, those type of things, you know, to help fight the boredom as well. We had one young lady that uh, there was not supposed to be anybody pregnant out there because obviously we have no prenatal care, uh, no OB services. And then six months later, she uh, delivered a premature child. So that made for a very very busy day trying to figure out how we were going to get her and the child off island, what we were going to do for evac, because to get an evac plane out to Shimia Island is about 24 hours. So you have to be willing to hold those patients. Did you guys do the delivery? Uh, I did, unfortunately, have to do that delivery. That was a, a heck of a round, you know, when you're just not expecting that. You didn't even know you had a pregnant person on island. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. So uh, you had mentioned something in the introduction about South America and oil wells. One of the companies that I had been introduced to when I was uh, working in it, out at Shimia Island was doing offshore oil drilling support off the coast of Suriname, South America. So I would fly into Trinidad, Tobago. We picked up the oil rig there and it was a jackup rig. So we actually floated it at about two knots. It was very slow. Uh, and drag it around uh, and parked it about 60 kilometers off the coast of Paramaribo. And we would do 28 day on, 28 day off rotations. But they had a physician that was there for the rig. We were hired to support the uh, Japanese oil company that was contracting that drilling, exploratory drilling rig. Although uh, we wound up treating everyone. There was no discrimination between, oh, no, I'm not paid to take care of you, or yes, I am. But we were there for heart attacks, strokes, uh, hypertension. That was the beginning parts of Zika virus. We had injuries. It was a very interesting experience because I would start my day in a t-shirt, a pair of shorts, 
go up on deck, eat, and then watch as they dump the food-only scraps overboard. So we would have pods of dolphins, sea turtles, and huge whales that would come through. Uh-huh. The, the whale sharks loved it. So it was a great, it was like going, going to SeaWorld every morning, yeah. <laughs> just watching this. And then I would go into the company man's office on the executive level and do evacuation planning and so on. So it wasn't direct patient care for me on necessarily a day-to-day basis. That's what the rig physician took care of. So is it those stories aren't enough? Do you have any more? Have you done other things overseas and remote work? So in January of 2020, I was contacted and asked if I would be interested in building some ice roads and doing some exploratory work, this time with oil on land instead of at sea. So I wound up in the Arctic Circle and I was going to be supporting remote areas where we had to build the road to get out there. So it was very unique. We would take these large uh, vehicles called Roligons and it looks like a semi truck, but it has large balloon wheels like a whole banded wheel underneath and it rolls like a giant caterpillar over the frozen tundra to get you out uh, where you're going to be so out there it was a little bit different in that we didn't do day-to-day care what we did is acute sick call and traumas that that was our, our key component but i will tell you unfortunately two months into our project covid kicked off and i suddenly found myself in a position where it was more like developing emergency plans for COVID. I, you know, I guess it just highlights the fact that when you step into these environments, you have to be prepared for just about anything. Sounds like you have to be the type of person that can kind of roll with the punches. <laughs> that should be my middle name, can roll with the punches. I love that. And I will tell you from assignment number one in Iraq, where I had no idea what I was doing and walked into a hornet's nest and survived it. Uh, I don't know how some days to then working on the ice roads in the middle of COVID. Every assignment has been different. And I guess I I could admit I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. So going into those scenarios actually kind of makes me happy. Um, I thrive on not just delivering medicine, but delivering the best possible medicine I can do in an austere environment where that patient is scared to death because they know they're not someplace close to a hospital. They know care is a day away. And they know that their friends, even though they're not medical, are going to be in that room with them, helping to take care of them, watching them, bringing them food, bringing them water, doing whatever they need to do. And that family, that's what makes me go back every time. To be honest with you, sometimes I've looked at these jobs and I've thought, yeah, I know there's going to be stressful situations, but I also kind of thought, you know, they seem kind of like they have a lot of laid back times, like, you know, how busy can it be when you got 150 people on a base or 40 people on a base. I mean, you know, is it as stressful as working on a regular family practice clinic or emergency room clinic? Am I totally off base or is there part of that that's true? You're spot on. And this is not for everyone. If you enjoy going into the office and socializing with people, this job may actually be for you because a lot of it is being there, um, in a different environment, being willing to be flexible, knowing that you're not going to have all the resources, not getting frustrated when you don't have the resources, just sorting out how you can do best by the patient. But then number two is part of that job is being the mental health provider for these people, being their friend. Sometimes just sitting it at a different table at every meal because they have people have a tendency to cluster together in their little cliques or groups. And so every single meal, I would go sit at a different table and talk to people. Because then if they were having a bad day, they would come and talk to you because nobody wants to have a suicide in their camp. But I think that that's part of what draws really unique, quirky individuals to these jobs. But the nice part is, is I don't have to write big, long notes. I don't have to build insurance. I don't have to do all those things that would in the business side of medicine that none of us love to do. And, and you don't have somebody constantly knocking on your door saying, next patient, next patient. I assume that if you need to spend a little extra time with somebody that you have that total flexibility to do that, unless there's an absolute emergency. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I have hours. I have hours and hours. So if I have somebody who has diffuse abdominal pain tonight, um, I can maybe hold them for 12 hours, see if that develops, re-examine them in the morning, and then make a decision on my concerned enough to spend $50,000 evacuating them off this island, off this base, wherever I'm at. 
to send them into future care or did they just have a little gas from the bad curry at dinner and they're going to feel yeah. better in 12 hours? One of the questions I was going to ask is I, I assume that for any of these positions, you really need to have some decent emergency care experience. I would say yes. For me, I was lucky enough to get some time in as well in occupational medicine, because again, that is kind of the unspoken component of all this too, is that you are there with company uh, individuals. This is not private people coming into your clinic. So you have to have at least the basic understandings of occupational medicine and the bear traps that you can step into with that, you know, reportables versus recordables and so on. But yes, emergency medicine is very important because you need to know, as my preceptors always said, and even my docs now, got to know when you're holding a snake. Because if you don't, then you can't trust your gut instinct. You're constantly going to be going, oh my gosh, I don't know. Everybody's not sick or everybody's sick. And that's, there's a fine line between the two sometimes. So yeah, emergency medicine, I would say three to five years of emergency medicine experience before you really would feel comfortable going out on these. Nobody's going to feel comfortable on their first assignment. And I highly recommend your first assignment, if you can find it, be three months. The short three-month gig, some place to figure out, do you like it? Do they like you? Is this a lifestyle for you? You know, you've kind of highlighted some of the things you've done. What other places have you heard about or ever come across or seen listings for type of remote jobs that you haven't taken, but that you're just aware of? I have a friend and I would love to have this. He works with a company that provides uh, care on movie sets. So if they are going to have actors on set, he goes out and he helps with some of the security evaluations, does day-to-day sick call there for injuries and so on. Usually that industry is being covered by paramedics and they do a beautiful job, but there are some that are starting to realize as actors or directors, producers, whomever may be on, on site, on scene in an uh, austere environment, such as South America filming, um, their healthcare systems are not up to the same standards that U.S. healthcare systems are. And we're starting to see an expanse of advanced practice providers, both PAs and nurse practitioners into that realm. Are they hired through companies like Beacon or other of these remote um, medical companies? I'm not entirely sure because that is uh, such a small component and everybody is very tight-lipped about how to get those jobs because they're protective of it and I don't blame them. I haven't been able to break in and find out the insider information. Ah, (laughs) I've always wondered if like on expeditions like if REI has these treks or National Geographic is going out filming somewhere around the world. I've always wondered if, you know, PAs and NPs are used in in those situations Um, and, and are you aware of that or is that more of a paramedic thing? International SOS has some components of private care. So if you are if you are National Geographic and you're doing, you know, like a hundred person trek or a twenty person trek or whatever, they do sometimes hire NPs PAs, but I'm not entirely sure uh, if they have like a pool of providers that they're working oh, but- from because I've never been able to find an advertisement for that. And it's still going back to a lot of this is it's so much cheaper for them to hire a paramedic versus an NP or PA. But the backside of that is what we do is more advanced procedural based and medicine based. That comes along with a lot of equipment. And if you're in an expedition where you can't take that equipment, then I'm useless. You know, they can they can hire a paramedic and and go down the cheaper route. What about dispensing medicines, though? Can paramedics dispense medicines? Like if you had, like if, if they were sent out on this, on an expedition or whatever, and, and they sent you with a supply of different antibiotics or, you know, things, can paramedics do that? Or? So paramedics can work understanding protocols in the oh, field. Okay. Well, they can have standing protocols as well. So if somebody presents with cough, cold, fever, you know, it, then they get amoxicillin unless they have an al- penicillin-based allergy and then they get this. So most of the times, if they're going to venture into giving prescription medications, then they're supposed to call their supervising doctor, their uplink, whoever their their base you know would be, and let them know what's going on and get permission. Beyond the things we talked about that you have to be prepared for and to think about on the medical side, uh, there's always the business side. You have to think about um, you know pay and and uh, all those kind of logistics. Tell us a little bit about what you've found so far. Is is pay mostly 1099 or are they W-2 or a combination of those? Is there room to negotiate salary? What kind of benefits kind of come along? Anything else that you think is important to people to know when they look at these positions? 
So ultimately, most of them are 1099. Uh, when you're on overseas contracts, there is the component of being considered an expat. So if you're in expat status for, it used to be, I'm not sure if it still is, 330 days out of the year, or 335 days, then you did not have to pay taxes on the first so much, which was about six figures. So that did make a difference, but that meant you could only be in the U.S. for about a month out of the entire year. So you have to get very comfortable with your family and friends traveling to meet you someplace outside the U.S. Um, those 1099 contracts are also important because you need to realize that you're going to be paying both sides of the taxes. So make sure that what they're offering you financially uh, equates to enough to be able to pay in all of those taxes um, that you're not W-2'd for. In some cases, you will be W-2'd, which may come along with benefits or it may not. So be mindful that you're also asking, is there benefits? Do I get medical, dental, retirement? Retirement being a key component here, because if you plan on doing this lifestyle like I have for the last 10 years, not having somebody contribute to your uh, retirement account do does make a difference in what I want on my day rate as well. And then make sure when somebody is asking to pay you on an hourly rate that you understand exactly how many hours in a day that's being paid for. Is that an eight hour day in a clinic, 10, 12 or 24? Because usually when they're breaking it down to hourly, you're not going to come out well at the end of that contract. Yeah, but you're going to be expected probably to be available 24 <laughs> seven. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, there needs to be some sort of on call incentive there. Got it. What about things like malpractice insurance? Is that usually paid for by whoever you're working for? Yeah, that's actually an excellent point, Michelle. Uh, I have had to leave a contract before because I was told that there was malpractice insurance and then come to find out they had a liability insurance, but not true malpractice insurance. So I had to leave that contract before I ever really got started because without malpractice insurance covered by them, it was going to be very expensive for me to pick up not only the policy, but then the tail coverage. So make sure that when you're going through the negotiation process or even before that, when you're still just finding out about the job, make sure you understand who's covering the malpractice insurance and the tail coverage, because that will make a difference as well. The other thing that you need to consider is extraction insurance. So if you're working in hostile environments or someplace where you could be kidnapped, you want to make sure that that company is also reputable and, and uh, will be covering any type of extraction insurance as well. Yeah, a lot of different things. You don't have to think about extraction insurance when you go apply at your local hospital. <laughs> so true. Do you normally have to have, you know, PALS, ATLS and all of that stuff in addition to BCLS and ACLS? Yeah, most companies uh, will want you to have some form of advanced trauma life support. Some of them will accept uh, pre-hospital, although most do want true ATLS. Um, but yes, a ACLS, ATLS, uh, PALS, still a lot of them want you to still have PALS, even if you're not necessarily going to be seeing uh, pediatrics on a regular basis. And that's part of the negotiation process, too, is making sure they're going to be willing to pay for those as well. I started to ask about licensing and I thought oh, that doesn't matter, but but does it matter? Like, has well, your state license come into play? So, again, to be in the federal system, you have to have an active state license somewhere. But additionally, like working in Mishimia Island and the Arctic Circle, I had to have an Alaska license uh, in order to not have to pull my DEA back and forth between the two. I actually had two DEA licenses as well, which gets expensive to maintain after a while. And so if people are watching this and they're, you know, this is going to appeal to, a, you know, a very small <laughs> subset of people. Uh, but if somebody is really interested in, in doing this, what kind of advice can you give them on where to find these jobs? So I do recommend that you do your research, no matter what company that you find, because there are several startups or smaller companies out there, but Wilderness Medical is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Remote Medical International, they are based out of Seattle, Washington, and they've had contracts all over the world in combat zones to, you know, the contract out on Shimia Island. Uh, there is Beacon, which was actually bought out by International SOS. Uh, Fairweather is also operating out of Alaska, and they have several contracts around the world. So I would highly recommend that if you're truly interested in doing this and you have, feel like you have the experience and want to start now, get onto your search engines and look to see if there's other uh, opportunities out there, like UTMB holds the contract for Antarctica. But you're probably going to have to really go to these companies' websites and then actively 
stalk those websites to see when these job positions come open. But like I said, make sure you do your research, make sure it's a reputable company and make sure that you review all of their expectations of you and then tell them your expectations of them. So hopefully there's less surprises when you ultimately show up on day one. So I understand in in talking to you earlier that you have taken kind of your experiences doing this and and parlayed it into another business that you're you're actively growing. Uh, Can you tell us what that business is and kind of what you do? Absolutely. So I took all of this experience, like you said, and kind of rolled it up and sort of getting requests to lecture to PA programs to students to let them know that there is options out there outside of traditional clinical medicine. But we also talk about um, many different aspects. I also do point of care ultrasound uh, classes, uh, also train the trainers for uh, programs that are trying to get a, a POCUS program off the ground and running either in clinic or within the first year or second year of PA programs. So that that turned into Nomad AEM, which is our comp- company, Nomad AEM Global Solutions. Uh, my husband and I do consulting work all over the world. Uh, right now, like I said, our, our biggest focus is is continuing to educate people about what advanced practice providers can do and how that can advance their business. So if people want to hire you or contact you for some information about your business, uh, I assume we can have that, we'll have that email address down below in the description box, right, where people can reach out to you. Absolutely. I'd love to talk to anyone. That's great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Melinda, for sharing uh, your awesome experiences with us and letting us know that if you don't want to stay in the box, if you want to have a unique and different career, it is something that is totally available to us as PAs and, and to some extent NPs as well. Thank you again, Michelle. I appreciate the opportunity to share. And I thank you for opening up the eyes to all the advanced practice providers about what's out there on a day to day basis. Well, thank you. The PA and NP professions offer so much versatility. So remember, if you're working in a job that you don't particularly like, there are tons of possibilities out there. You just have to learn about them and be open to them and search for them. So if you're still looking for where you fit in medicine and looking for those opportunities that are right for you, then watch the videos in these playlists here. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you found this as interesting as I did Take care, stay sane, and I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye.